This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare, January 17th, only on Netflix. Building a portfolio with Fidelity Basket Portfolios is kind of like making a sandwich. It's as simple as picking your stocks and ETFs, sort of like your meats and other topics, and managing it as one big, juicy investment. Mmm, now that's pretty good. Learn more at fidelity.com slash baskets. Investing involves risk, including risk of loss. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. Member NYSC SIPC. Start your wellness journey at Whole Foods Market, where it's jumpstart January through the 16th. Stock up on supplements with some of the year's biggest savings. Plus, save on air-chilled organic boneless skinless chicken breasts, organic honey crisp apples, organic large Haas avocados, and more. And since Whole Foods Market is the only certified organic national grocer, it's easy to make them your wellness destination. Jumpstart your January now at Whole Foods Market. The creatures of the night, one of mankind's oldest enemies. They are fearsome monsters who lurk in the darkness of the moon. A nasty bunch. While there are good people among them, the majority of them are pure monsters. Where else do you think people get their fear of the dark from? A creature of the night, also known as a child of the night, is a type of dark mythical creature in folklore all around the world. There are many definitions of what a creature of the night is. The main idea is that a creature of the night is a supernatural, mostly malevolent creature that comes from the darkness of the moon. They are known as the opposites and enemies of angels, which also indirectly makes them the allies of demons. Pretty scary stuff. There's actually a medical term for fear of the dark. It's called nyctophobia. By definition, nyctophobia is an extreme fear of night or darkness that can cause intense symptoms of anxiety or depression. A fear becomes a phobia when it's excessive, irrational, or impacts your day-to-day life. Being afraid of the dark often starts in childhood and is viewed as a normal part of development. Studies focused on this phobia have shown that humans often fear the dark for its lack of any visual stimuli. In other words, people may fear the night and darkness because they can't see what's around them. The symptoms you may experience with nectophobia are much like those you would experience with other phobias. People with this phobia often experience extreme fear that causes distress when they're in the dark. Symptoms may interfere with daily activities, school, or work performance. They even may lead to serious health issues. Different phobias share similar symptoms. These signs may be either physical or emotional. With nectophobia, symptoms may be triggered by being in the dark or even thinking about situations where you'd find yourself in the dark. Growing up, I was terrified of my basement in my childhood home. The stairs were old and creaky. They sat behind an old steel door that had one bulb that dangled from a wire in the middle of the steps. At the bottom was an earth floor and a hallway that had an old giant boiler in it. It was dark and cobwebby. We also had access to the basement through a flight of stairs in our kitchen, but those steps were carpeted and led to a well-lit family room where me and my brother would play and where our family would gather to watch movies. But that room had a door that led to the creepy part of the basement that I always made sure was locked any time I was down there alone. I have a vivid memory of sitting down there alone watching the series premiere of, ironically enough, Are You Afraid of the Dark, back around Halloween in 1991. I was eight and was entirely too freaked out that I got up and turned all the lights on. Like most basements where I grew up, and pretty much in the time I grew up, it had a drop ceiling with fluorescent tube lighting. Well, that night, one of those suckers decided to call it quits, and it sent me running up the stairs to the safety of my covers in a hurry. It turns out there's a reason for that. As children, we all seem to go through a scared-of-the-dark phase. Back when we were younger, and in a lot of ways, fearless in the face of things we're more cautious about as adults, there was something about darkness that put us on edge every night. After all, that's when the monsters come out to play. Even though that sounds like a childish thing to believe in, 
Our fear of the dark is an evolutionary trait that we picked up to survive real-life predators stalking the night. Researchers have hypothesized that this innate fear stems from a point in human history when we were nowhere near the top predators we are today. Humans only became super predators with the advent of technology, which really wasn't that long ago. Before tech, our ancestors were constantly on the lookout for predators that wanted nothing more than to chow down on human sandwiches. And if that wasn't scary enough, most of these predators hunted at night, a time of day when we are especially vulnerable to attack because of our relatively poor eyesight. This means that it was super important for our ancestors to stay safe in the middle of the night. If they didn't, they'd die. Over the years, this nightly fear became instinctual, and we still experience it today as a form of mild anxiety. According to Andrew Tarantola at Gizmodo, a 2012 study by researchers at the University of Toronto in Canada claimed that this anxiety isn't a full-blown panic reaction. Instead, it's kind of like a lingering, foreboding fear that keeps us on edge, which is exactly what our ancestors needed. This type of anxiety is your body's way of keeping you on your toes in case you need to fight or flight yourself away from danger. Being afraid of the dark is simply, in essence, a fear of the unknown. When we can't see what's out there, it freaks us out because our imagination fills in the worst possible thing. For ancient humans, it was lions and other predators. And in today's big predator-free cities, it's monsters. We create monsters because they fill that predator void. A great example of this is how horror movies work. Good ones never directly show you the monster because your imagination makes something way scarier. As early human civilizations slowly morphed into the city-loving societies we have today, our fear of the dark remained. Only it's a bit strange now because most of us don't need to fear the dark, especially because we have light bulbs, iPhones, and TV sets. For better or worse, rather than the inevitable. Though we don't technically need this fear, it's still there. And it's confusing. These traits are normally passed down by distant relatives over the centuries to the point of getting it implanted in our psyche. When you consider how long humans have been around, it wasn't until very recently that this fear became almost obsolete. So if you or a child in your life is afraid of the dark, remember that at one time it was a vital survival instinct that kept our collective ancestors alive. It doesn't make you a chicken. It makes your body more attuned to threats. Yeah, that's it. Not a chicken at all. Hey folks, we're going to go off the script here for a minute. I wanted to discuss that yes, this is the first Monday in May, and this is not a Zachary Bain episode. The Zachary Bain episodes will be continuing, but just more sporadically. I'm going to keep the show with my normal format of uh, folklore and original stories linked to that folklore uh, twice a month with a Zachary Bain episode thrown in periodically. Thank you for the kind words, the reviews, the emails, and the messages you've sent on my socials about the story. I'm happy everybody really likes it. Hopefully in the near future, I have some exciting news to announce, which you know I really can't wait for. So thank you all again, and uh, back to business. This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare, January 17th, only on Netflix. Start your wellness journey at Whole Foods Market, where it's jumpstart January through the 16th. Stock up on supplements with some of the year's biggest savings. Plus, save on air-chilled organic boneless skinless chicken breasts, organic honey crisp apples, organic large Haas avocados, and more. And since Whole Foods Market is the only certified organic national grocer, it's easy to make them your wellness destination. Jumpstart your January now at Whole Foods Market. At Salesforce, we're all about asking more of AI. Questions like, where's the data going? Is it secure? Are you sure? Are you sure you're sure? Get answers you can trust from Salesforce at askmoreofai.com. In the not-too-distant future... It's been 25 years since the latest and, well, last world war. I hear the times have changed, but I really don't know any different. I know we didn't fire the first nuke. I guess that counts for something. 
it was bad. The population of the planet was halved, and then half of the survivors either starved to death or died of radiation poisoning. Most of the Earth was rendered useless. Nothing would grow. The power grids were shot. Rolling blackouts became a normal thing. And then eventually the rolling stopped, and full-on blackouts were life for many for a very long time. Eventually, the remaining government stepped in and tried to help to the best of their ability. They stabilized the power the best they could. They were able to provide enough to get the people through their days. But once nightfall came, they would shut down to reserve what power they could. Everyone also received monthly food and gas stipends. Just a few gallons in the basics. A few pounds of rice and flour, potatoes and peanut butter. Meat was something only the super wealthy could enjoy. A guy down the road from us had a few mutey chickens, but we never bought any eggs from him. I wasn't interested in tasting an egg that came out of a two-headed chicken, thank you very much. We get by, though. We had a small garden growing in our basement in pots. Tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, and peppers. We don't risk growing outdoors. People would see it and take it. My dad found an old Honda generator, and we used the few gallons of gas we get to power it. It's enough to run the lights and keep us with fresh vegetables. We're lucky. It's a lot more than what most people have. Our house is far out from our neighbors, and the old generator is quiet enough not to draw too much attention. We painted our basement windows so the light at night don't get seen. We spend our nights down there. My parents, my grandfather, and myself. The dark, you see. The dark is the real problem. No one knows where they came from. My mother believes they've always been here. It's just that they haven't been able to get around as easily as they do now. The first attacks happened shortly after the power started going out. People going missing, always at night, always in the dark. You wouldn't believe how slow word spreads with no internet. Eventually, people started to do most of their traveling and chores during the day. The few who still had jobs, mostly farming on government land and handyman-type work, kept daytime hours. The government set up hydroponic grow houses, and most of the population lived within a short distance to them. Living too far was risky. You could burn through your gas allotment and not have a way to get around. We had a small truck, but we only used it to take Grandpa for his monthly checkups. I ride a bike everywhere. For a while, we used the truck for the monthly supply pickup, but on a scavenging run, I found a medium-sized pull cart, and I was able to build a rig that I can attach to my bike and pull it. Saves us our gas for the generator, and affords us the luxury of living a little bit further from everyone else. I had just finished a scavenger run and was heading back home. Tomorrow was supply day, and I wanted to see if maybe I can find some new tires. The ones on my bike still had plenty of tread. It was the cart I was worried about. They were looking a little dry-rotted. Lucky enough, I found an old patch kit that was left in the rubble of what was once a sporting goods store, I'm told. I was going to have a busy morning. I would spend the rest of today prepping for my run, making sure I had my pack and whatever supplies I needed. This patch kit would fit in nicely. It was about a two-hour ride into the city and three coming back once I was packed up with my family stipend. I wanted to get there early, but I had to wait for the sun to be fully up before I left. They say the attacks mostly happen in or around cities, but there have been rumors of people out here on the outskirts being taken, and I'm someone who likes to play it safe, so I'd miss being the first in line. That was okay. Even if I had to wait hours, I'd still be done and packed up with enough time to get home before sundown. Miss Richter and her daughter lived up the road about a half mile, and her house has a deck that comes off the second floor. She grows jalapeno and eggplants up there. We sometimes trade with her. Her daughter went to pick up the stipend last month, and she never came home. Her bike was found with a broken front rim about two miles from her house. It was facing the direction of home, but all of her supplies were gone. The road nearby was splashed with blood. My dad thinks it had to be coyotes or maybe a pack of hungry dogs. He don't believe the things in the dark come out this far. But it's still something to worry about. Dogs would have left something behind. At dusk, me and my dad went about our normal routine of checking around the property, looking for anything out of the ordinary, any sign that looks like animals or people have been around. Everything looked good, so I helped him with the generator 
and then headed down to the basement, where it's light, where it's safe. You get used to sleeping with the lights on. My bag was packed and waiting by the door with my normal supplies, a crank flashlight hooked onto the back within easy reach, some food, a canteen of boiled rainwater, and my knife. Once the sun was fully up over the horizon, I set out. The morning was chilly, but the sun was strong, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. This was another perk to taking the bike. Nowadays, the roads are in such disrepair that there are so many breakdowns just left behind that you have to drive clear into the dirt beyond the shoulder to get around at some spots. You risk getting stuck and having to go on foot and not making it back before the sun goes down. Even with my wagon trailer, I can weave in and out. Once I got to the distribution center, the line was just as expected. Long. I parked my bike in the normal spot I leave it when I come. All the way up front, around the corner from the building entrance. Sure, I have to walk all the way back to the end of the line, but it makes my life that much easier when I'm done. Some people who have carts or bikes try to keep them in position next to them when they're on line in the road. They get off the line and move them up as the line moves along, but sometimes this leads to problems. You get the people that see you getting on and off line, and for some reason it really bothers them. They think you're getting away with something or cheating them somehow. Things are stressful enough, and people's short fuses are even shorter lately. I don't give anyone a reason to start in. I get to the back of the line and take my place behind a young, grungy-looking man. He may have been in his mid-thirties. A stocky build, wearing faded jeans with engineer boots and a leather vest. His skin was almost as leathery as his jacket. Compared to the other people in line, he looked like he was eating good. Probably scamming the government. I had no idea how things like that happened. Odds are, he was claiming more people that he had in his household and keeping it all for himself. We have an audit every six to eight months where an agent from the government comes out and do what they call a wellness check. We know they're really counting people and seeing if you're keeping any livestock or growing anything they can repo. So thankful for the generator. They never come inside. They just ask all the people who live in your home to come out. Of course you're gonna. If you don't, that's one less stipend you're going to receive. They also issue you a card and get all members of your household to sign it, designating one person as the point of contact. The one who will be making the monthly pickup so everyone doesn't have to come. They save time and space that way. He turned around once I took my place behind him and gave me a what's up head nod. He was smoking a stinking hand-rolled cigarette, breathing in deep to his lungs and exhaling out of a nose riddled with blackheads. I just smiled and gave a small nod back. I pulled out an old magazine that I found on a scavenging trip and hoped he would take the hint. He didn't. Bigger turnout than last month. Looks like more people are relocating around here. He was right. It did look more crowded. I gave him an unenthusiastic, yeah. But he didn't take the bait from that either. You local? Kinda. Not much of a talker, huh? Jackpot. No, not really, sorry. That's okay. I'm enough for the both of us. Great. This is gonna be a long day. I live right up the street here. Work part-time at this here warehouse. Nights. Twice a week. Better in there than out here, I say. You know what I mean? Once they shut the power off, this city gets eerie. It's dark. Real dark. We don't have the luxury of the open sky. No moonlight for us, no ma'am. The buildings block that out. Ever been on the streets at dusk? No, I can't say that I have. Kinda local. I can tell you firsthand that the dusk in this city is about an hour before anywhere else. And once those street lights start going out, you better get yourself somewhere safe. I remember as a kid, my grandmama telling me that back when she was a little girl... The rule of thumb was we get in the house before the streetlights came on. Funny how things change now, huh? I adopted the if you can't beat him, join him mentality. And if I'm being 100% honest, he wasn't that bad. As the line crawled along, we got to chatting. About our home lives, about what we did. Both of us playing it close without giving up too much. It was about 2 p.m. and we were about three quarters of the way to the front. Maybe another hour or two. And I'd be done and home by 7. Plenty of time. It was then when I heard the warble of sirens that my heart sunk. It was the medical van. 
Someone was in distress. It had to be bad because they didn't come out and waste resources for anything minor. I prayed that it was for someone behind us in line, as crappy as that may sound. I couldn't afford to waste any time, but as luck would have it, it wasn't. This held us up for another hour. Once the line started moving again, it was after five before I got inside. I had to be quick. I glanced towards the street my bike and cart were on, before walking through the doors, and the guy in front of me, who I've been sharing this afternoon with, must have noticed, because he whispered to me, I park over there also, and shot me a wink. We said our goodbyes, and he went in first, and I followed shortly after. I will give them this. Usually government workers take their time, but these folks are really efficient at what they do. They want you in and out. The pack I bring with me has hook loops sewn into it in various spots. This way I can hook everything onto me in the bags that they're in, and walk to the cart, and not have to worry about walking back and forth and someone potentially walking off with my stuff. It was after five now. A little over three hours until sundown. I'm still in good shape. As I waddled out of the warehouse and down the street, moving as fast as I can to get to my bike and get it packed, as I was stacking my packages and bunging them down with cords, I noticed the lean. The right tire on the cart was flat. Great. I dug through my pack for the patch kit. I pulled it out and quickly read the instructions. I took out my small tool kit and started to take the tire off when I noticed that no patch kit was going to help this. The tire rotted out completely. It looked like chunks of rubber were missing. How the hell did I get here with it like that? Time for plan B. Attach everything to my pack and ride back like that. That may take me a little longer, but I should still make it. Almost six o'clock now. With everything rebagged and strapped into my back, I was ready to move. It wasn't until I stepped my leg over and sat down that I noticed my front tire was slashed. My heart caught in my throat. I had to think fast and move even faster. If I could make it out of the city, I could take shelter inside one of the abandoned cars dotting the road back home. I could find one with intact windows, climb in and lock the doors, and lay low until morning. Hell, I'll use the bags and some of my clothes to block out the windows. It was the best plan I could come up with. I had to move. The shadows from the setting sun were starting to grow, and some streets were already pitched into darkness. The only thing keeping them lit was the soft glow from the streetlights. I had to get to the city's edge before they shut off. As I made my way back toward the main road, I noticed the crowds had dispersed immensely, and to my dismay, there was only a sliver of sunlight peeking over the buildings. Soon, the only light that would be provided would be by the streetlights, and from what I can see, more than half of them were broken. I had to move. I could swing around and head west toward the setting sun, but that would take me further away from home, and I'd have to double back. I didn't know the roads out that way. I had a plan, and I had to stick to it. I was moving a lot slower than I thought I would be. The heavy bags were beginning to take its toll. That sliver of sunlight was gone now, and all that was left in the sky was an orange tint. The yellow lights buzzed above me as I made my way out of the city. The streets were deserted. The alleys between the buildings to my left and right were pitched in darkness. My heart was pounding. The sound of garbage cans being rummaged through in the dark in those alleys made my blood run cold. Rats. That's all. That's what it has to be. It's rats. Or cats. Some kind of animal. That's all. The sky, a dark blue now above me. Still another mile to go before I'm out of the city. I'm not going to make it. The sounds of footsteps growing behind me, seeming to stop at the mouth of the street, not leaving the alley, not entering the streetlights. My body is completely exhausted. My thighs burn. Every step I take, a sack of 20 pounds of potatoes swings out and hits into the back of them. I'll have a bruise there tomorrow, no doubt. If there is a tomorrow... I can't think that way. People are depending on me. I gotta keep moving. The loud clicking behind me made me jump and catch my breath. My imagination started running wild. I was imagining the clicks of giant teeth snapping together. Fangs covered in gore, dripping with drool in anticipation of their next meal. Razor-sharp claws clicking on the concrete as these things waited for the opportunity to attack. Impatiently tapping those monstrous feet with their arms crossed, waiting for me to make a mistake. What the clicks actually were was much worse. It was the streetlights shutting off block by block 
as the grid was being shut down. Run. Gotta run now. I started running for the edge of the city, the dark chasing me, at my heels, getting closer. Just keep going. The street lights up ahead were still on. The edge of town was still a few more streets now, but those lights started shutting off. Standing in an intersection, they were shutting down all around me. I reached around my back and unhooked my crank light and took cover against a corner building under one of the last remaining powered lights and cranked like my life depended on it, because it just may. All at once, the light overhead clicked off and I was in the dark. I hope I cranked enough. I pushed the power button and... nothing. What the... I slapped the side of this stupid thing and that's when I heard the sprinkle of glass hit the sidewalk. The sack of potatoes must have swung into it while I was running and broke the lens. I started hugging the wall, running my fingers across it while I made my way up the street in total darkness. The sound of feet making their way toward me echoed off the buildings, making it impossible to tell what direction it was coming from. The panting breath was getting closer now. Closer. I was spinning around, looking in all directions. I had no idea which way I was facing now. I couldn't see a foot in front of my face. From across the street, I heard a voice shout, This way! Silhouetted in the doorway, holding a lantern, was the man from the line. He tossed what looked like a road flare into the street in my direction. All I heard was a splitting roar, and I only caught a glimpse of it. It looked like a mutated dog standing on two legs. The eyes on its head were enormous, like tea saucers. It shot its clawed hands up to its face to block out the light and shrieked in pain before running into the opposite direction. I darted toward the man, and once inside, he slammed the door behind me. Follow me. It's not safe up here. He brought me around into stairs that headed into a basement. Once down there, the place was glowing with flame light. It was huge down here. Like all the basements of the buildings around have been connected. Caught some tough luck up there, huh? You're not kidding. I had two flats. Oh, that was your bike? I saw that one. I told you I parked over there as well. I thought the person was going to be in for a surprise. I never thought it would be you. Yeah, I was surprised all right. Thanks for the save. What is this place? We call it the community. It's really the only reason we stay in the city. We pool all our resources, and since the basements are connected, we can run up to multiple buildings come audit time. Get extra rations. It works out well. As I walked through this place, I saw people milling about. There were metal barrels with fires going, and crude chimneys above them piping out smoke. Yeah, this place is a secret. Can't risk the whistle being blown on us, you know? Well, it's safe with me. Yeah, huh? Well, unfortunately, we can't let you leave. All eyes on this place seemed to look in my direction. They stopped what they were doing and stared. Um, listen, I'm grateful for the save and all, but I have to get back to my family. He turned and started to walk again, and I followed him. Most of us had families we couldn't return to. We know what it's like. We all got the same offer. We made our turn into a large cavern area where it looked like hundreds of people were gathered. Yes, that's great. I'm sure it was a very tough decision for you all, but it's not for me. I can't stay here. That's when the smell first hit me. A delicious smell. The smell of roasting meat. I scanned the room and saw what looked like a pit, and a big man working a crank, slowly turning it and roasting whatever was on the spit. These people had to be cooking dogs or rats, whatever strays they can find. Ugh, that made my stomach turn. The vomit came up and caught in my throat once my eyes adjusted, and I saw what they were really cooking. Well, I'd be lying if I say we weren't glad you said that. We're running low on fresh meat. My mother was right. The monsters had always been here. I'm Christopher Feinstein. And this is Haunted American History. Music by Kevin MacLeod. 